This Sunday is Mother's Day, so before we begin our Ecclesiastes study, just a short video as a tribute to moms. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. <sighs> Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back, Mommy, where are you going? sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to Daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you would speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in... Uh... Welcome back to our study of Ecclesiastes. Uh, today, chapters 6 and 7, where Solomon teaches us First of all, to enjoy the good things that God has given us. And secondly, to make wise decisions. Now, perhaps you've noticed as we've studied the book of Ecclesiastes, especially through these middle chapters, that there's a lot of similarities between the book of Proverbs, which Solomon also wrote, and the book of Ecclesiastes. They both deal with, with practical advice for godly living, everyday living. But there's an important distinction between the books, too. And, and one person, at least, has identified it as this, that Ecclesiastes is, is almost written as a, as a warning. That if you follow all the godly advice, the practical advice for daily living that's, that's given in the book of Proverbs, don't expect that that means that all your problems are going to go away. That somehow you will be lifted from this veil of te tears into a heaven on earth. There'll be no more consequences of sin troubling us. Instead, we will live in this wonderful utopia. Solomon is saying, no. There's still this futility of life that we struggle with, even as Christians, because we live in a broken world. And so there's this tension in the book of Ecclesiastes between the futility of life and that life is good and it's worth living. Now, how can it be both? How can it be meaningless, futile? and at the same time, good and worth living. Well, that's the tension that Solomon resolves for us in, in this book. And he'll completely answer when we get to chapter 12. We, we started, uh, we, I should say, last week we looked at, at chapter 5, and, and now in chapter 6, which we get to in this session, he really takes up that same theme. So I, I'd like to begin with the, uh, what we looked at at the very end of chapter 5. And that is, uh, if you look at, at verse 19. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is the gift of God. So, according to Solomon, at the end of chapter 5 there, what three things are gifts from God? Did you catch it? First of all, God gives wealth and possessions. Contrary to the American dream, there's no such thing as a self-made man. No, God gives us wealth and possessions. 
But, but God must give us something else, and that is the ability to enjoy those wealth, that wealth and, and those possessions. Otherwise, they're meaningless. And then finally, God must also give us this ability to accept our lot and to be happy in our toil. We might call that contentment. These three things, this is the gift of God. Now we come to chapter 6, and Solomon continues with that thought. He writes, I have seen another evil under the sun, and it weighs heavily on mankind. God gives some people wealth, possessions, and honor, so they lack nothing their hearts desire. But God does not grant them the ability to enjoy them, and strangers enjoy them instead. This is meaningless, a grievous evil. So again, God gives us wealth, possessions, and honor. I might think that it's my efforts and my labor that have given me these things. Solomon realizes and he teaches us, no, our efforts, our labor are simply the channels through which God gives us good things. But if God has not also given us the ability to enjoy them, then this is all meaningless. A man may have a hundred children and live many years. In that society, to have children, many children, was considered a, a sign of prosperity. Well, you could have a hundred children, maybe it's children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, live many years. Yet no matter how long he lives, if he cannot enjoy his prosperity and does not receive proper burial, and that might be a little puzzling for us, what, what does he mean, proper burial? Well, a proper burial in Solomon's day would mean that your family lamented your, your death. There were people that cared enough about you that they were sad when you died. That was a proper burial. Solomon's saying, you, you may be a wealthy man and have all kinds of material possessions, but if your family doesn't care about you, they don't even give you a, a proper burial, what was the point? They couldn't wait for the old man to die, and once he did die, they couldn't wait for the reading of the will. Uh, that's meaningless. I say, a stillborn child is better off than he. It comes without meaning, it departs in darkness, and in darkness its name is shrouded. Though it never saw the sun or knew anything, it has more rest than does that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice over, blessed with long life, blessed with many material possessions, blessed with a large family, but if he couldn't enjoy those possessions, if his family didn't love him, what was the point? Do not all go to the same place. All right, the first question I've got for you to wrestle with is this one. On what basis can Solomon say that a stillborn child is better off than someone who cannot enjoy their wealth? And I'll give you just a, a, maybe a, a little bit of a, a hint here. Solomon's not really getting into the issue, the theological implications of, of what happens with stillborn children. That, that's not his point here. This is an illustration. So don't think too deeply about this. Well, wh why would he say, you know, if, if you can't enjoy the blessings in life, including your family, then you might, I'll, I'll stop there and let you wrestle with the question. I'll give you, well, go ahead, pause the video, and when you're ready to uh, pick it up, Hit start. All right, again, don't try to delve too deeply into the, the fate of, of the stillborn. That's not Solomon's point here. And when he ends up by saying they both go to the same place, he, he's not talking about where they spend eternity. He's only talking about the grave. They both die. So what's he getting at? Well, maybe another way to ask the question is this. What, what does the stillborn child not have to deal with that this unhappy man does? Frustration? Annoyance? Loneliness? Remember, his family does not love him. All these things that, that he struggled with, it, the stillborn child knows none of that. If you can't enjoy the good things God has given you, Solomon is saying, you might... Might as well never have had them at all. Maybe we can ask another question here at this point. And that is, what, what keeps someone from enjoying the, the blessings that God has given them? I'm thinking here of material possessions. 
Well, you can probably think of many cases where someone thought that they had saved up a, a, a lot of wealth to enjoy life at, the, at the, the latter years of their life, and then they lost their health, and they couldn't enjoy it at all, or their marriage partner lost their health. Or, or maybe it was relationships, struggles in their family, again, between spouses or between parent and child that just brought so much misery. And it didn't matter how much wealth you had. Life was just miserable because the important relationships had fallen apart. Whatever it might be, the, the important thing here is that to enjoy those gifts is something that God must give us. Which then leads us now to the next set of verses, and that is 7 to 9. Everyone's toil is for their mouth. What, is, what does Solomon mean by that? We'll talk about that in just a moment. You know, what, what's the result of all this toil for our mouth? Yet their appetite is never satisfied. Why not? We'll talk about that too. What advantage have the wise over fools? So you, you make the good decisions in life. You, you think ahead. What does it get you? What did the poor gain by knowing how to conduct themselves before others? So, so if someone conducts themselves honestly, they're considerate and kind towards others, they do the right thing, but along comes a rich fool and everyone just pushes the poor man out of the way, even though he lived his life wisely because they are enamored with the riches. Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. All right, our next set of questions then are, are these. What does Solomon mean when he writes, all man's efforts are for his mouth? And why is he, that man, never satisfied? Explain Solomon's words. Better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. Again, go ahead and pause the video and restart it when you are ready to continue. All right, what does Solomon mean when he writes, all man's efforts are for his mouth? Well, the, the man without God lives just for his self-preservation to meet his physical needs. And I suppose in that sense, we, we would be no different than the chipmunks in my backyard that spend all their days scurrying around looking for something to eat or running away from the neighborhood cat. It's all self-preservation. Without God, without the spiritual aspect to our lives, we are no different than those animals. Why is he never satisfied? Explain the words better what the eye sees than the roving of the appetite. So someone has a loving, caring spouse but they have eyes for someone else's spouse. That looks better. They have a, a, a comfortable home, many earthly blessings, but, but they see a, a nicer home that someone else has. They see other blessings that they think they should have and, and don't, and it, it's this constant wanting more. They're never satisfied. What, maybe another way to ask this question is, what, what's really at the heart or the root of that? Augustine said this, the soul is restless, until it finds its rest in God. I think there's, there's one of two things going on here. Either the, the, the person is trying to fill this God-shaped hole in their heart with material things, and it's never going to work, so it's never enough. Or, if, if they know God, it's that they're, they're, they're trying to, to say, God, you didn't give me the right things. You didn't give me enough. It's this discontent with what God has given them. And maybe that still comes back to the same thing, which is saying, I'm looking for things to bring me happiness. And as long as you do that, as long as you think to find meaning and fulfillment and purpose in accumulating and enjoying the things of this world, you will never be satisfied. All right, going on then to the next section. Whatever exists has already been named, and what humanity is has been known. No one can contend with someone who is stronger. Most commentators think that uh, someone is referring to God. We, we, we can't, no matter how hard we try, unchange what he has said. The more the words, the less the meaning. And how does that profit anyone? 
For who knows what is good for a person in life during the few and meaningless days they pass through like a shadow? Who can tell them what will happen under the sun after they are gone? Again, a couple of questions here for you. Just one question, I guess. In verses 11 and 12, Solomon gives us some sobering words about talk. How does verse 12 help us control our thoughts and words? Go ahead and pause and restart when you're ready. All right. Human wisdom has no answers for the meaning of life, for life's most difficult questions. But that hasn't kept us from, from talking, has it? You and I, we have this, this horrible tendency, I'm afraid, to inflate our opinions, to think that we've got a lot to say, when the reality is we need, more often than not, just to put our hands over our mouth and to open our ears and listen to what God says. Solomon asked the question here, who knows what is good for us? And the answer it's not you or me or any other human voice. The one who knows what's good for us is our God. And thankfully, he speaks to us in his word. He shares his heart. He shares his wisdom with us. How blessed we are to have that wisdom. And yet so foolishly, we keep talking instead of listening. Thank God that he is patient with us. All right, this brings us to the halfway point of the book as we move from chapter 6 to chapter 7. And if, if we were listening to this live as Solomon were speaking in the city of Jerusalem, we might notice a, a change in his delivery here that suddenly there's a bit more energy to, to Solomon's voice as he shifts from asking questions to giving us answers. Up to this point, Solomon has talked about God. Yes, God has been there. But he's more emphasized life under the sun, life apart from God, and how meaningless it is. That switches now. As Solomon talks more about God and that there is meaning to life as we follow God's directions and live in his grace. So, chapter 7. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. Sometimes in the summer, well, first of all, when we uh, are done with our live Christmas tree, we throw it out in the woods next to the fire pit. And then that following summer, or maybe even the summer after, I will cut a branch from that Christmas tree and all those needles are dry and I'll throw it in the, in the fire and it will just crackle away, but just like that, it's gone. That's the image that Solomon is using in verse 6, the crackling of thorns under the pot in the fire. It, it makes a, a loud noise, but it really doesn't add much heat or much flame. It's, it's quickly gone. So is the laughter of fools. This, too, is meaningless. And maybe you're thinking, Pastor, what are, you, what are you talking about? That Solomon turns a corner here. He's more pessimistic than ever. Well, let's take a closer look at what he's saying here and think through it. And to help us with that, let's uh, take up this question. Why is sorrow better than laughter? And why is a funeral dinner better than a victory celebration? That seems pretty counterintuitive. Uh, gives that some thought, and when you're ready, restart the video. All right, is Solomon becoming more pessimistic? No, I, I don't think so. And, and to help us get at it, let, let's think of it this way. What, what's the, the problem with any victory celebration? What's it usually losing sight of? 
in the sinful, broken, temporary world. And that is the victory is only temporary. It doesn't last. What's the benefit? What's the good that comes out of a funeral dinner? Out of that attending a funeral? Well, it's looking at life realistically, isn't it? It, it, it's realizing that life is short and therefore I ought to treat it as something fragile and precious and not take any day for granted. It's one thing, I, I think there's an even greater benefit though to attending that funeral and that is I need a savior. I need a solution because left to myself, I've got no hope. My life too must end at the grave and unless there's someone who can save me from that grave, that any victory celebration in this life is just a, a fool's game. It's a distraction from my real problems. No, Solomon, or not Solomon, I'm sorry, Moses says in Psalm 90, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I believe that's what Solomon is talking about here too. There is value in realizing that life here, it will end. And therefore, the wise person knows what's coming after this life and is thinking towards that. All right, going on then with the next section. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of a matter is better than its beginning and patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, Why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. We'll come back to, to verse 10 in just a second, but uh, looking first of all at verse 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. Well, what, what do you think Solomon has in mind there? Yes, for, for me, that song we just sang this past Sunday comes to mind, All is Well. And there was that, that third stanza in that song that said, When we see our glorified and risen Lord, we will say, All is Well. I can't always understand why God allows the things to happen in my life that are happening right now. Some of it doesn't seem so good. How could God possibly be using this for a blessing? I struggle with that. But the end of the matter is better than the beginning. We need, need to wait to see how God works it all out. And that takes patience, doesn't it? Instead of a sinful pride that says, I know what's best, God, just do it my way. No, in humility to say, God, you take control of my life. I trust you will bring it to the right end. The opposite of patience is to be quickly provoked in spirit, to become angry. More on that uh, in the next section. But for right now, uh, let's take a look at verse 10. And why is it not wise, Solomon says, to long for the good old days? Again, uh, pause the recording, discuss that, and then restart. Why is it not wise to long for the good old days? Well, quite simply because the good old days weren't always so good. Someone has, has said it this way. The good old days are the product of a bad memory and a good imagination. Here's the reality that since the fall into sin, the days have been filled with evil. We know that from Scripture. We know that from experience. But this also we know, and that is that God's goodness has surrounded us all of our days. The days that we think are bad days, God is still there with us. He is still working all things together for our good. So even in the midst of, of hardship, we can still, as Paul says in Philippians, rejoice always, rejoice in the Lord, uh, because we know he is near. All right, the next section going on with verse 11. Wisdom like an inheritance is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. 
You think about a man who has the skill to do a certain job, and he may lose his money, but then he has the skill to, to earn that money back again. That, that's the shelter of wisdom. He knows uh, how to get by in life. Consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. Again, I'll have you take a look at this question, pause the recording, and consider what must history lead us to conclude? And what then is the implication? What must history lead us to conclude? That we are not in control, that God is. My thoughts here go back to chapter 3 where Solomon had said there's a time for everything. And he went through that list, a time to be born, a time to die, both things beyond my control. A, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a, a time when we can build up and a time when things get torn down. And it all seems so haphazard. I can't control it. History teaches me that. But Solomon is telling us here, God does control things. And so what's the implication of that? I need to trust God. He is control of what seems chaotic and haphazard to me in this time of, of pandemic and government decisions that we may or may not agree with it, uh, on any given day. It, it seems like so much of life is, is out of our control and is not the way we want it to be. It's okay. It's okay because God still is in control, and I can trust him. Go on to the next section. In this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these, the righteous perishing in their righteousness, and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Life under the sun, apart from God, it, it, it seems that the righteous perish. They sometimes suffer more for having been righteous. And the wicked, they, they seem to get the best of everything. Well, we know it just seems that way. But again, life under the sun, that's the way it appears. Solomon says, do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? And in a quick reading, it might seem like he's saying, well, don't be too good. And don't be too wise, because that will destroy you. But I don't believe he's saying that. Think a little bit more about what Solomon is, is saying there. Do not be over wicked and do not be a fool. So don't be too good, don't be too bad. Uh, I, I think that perhaps he has something else in mind. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. So what does Solomon have in mind here? What aspect of meaningless does Solomon speak about in verse 15? I think we already answered that. that you know, sometimes it seems the good suffer in this life while the bad get a pass. It only seems that way. What do you think he means, though, by over-righteous and over-wise? And what is the middle course he is advocating? Give that some thought. All right, what is the middle course here that Solomon is advocating? Is he saying, well, have a little fun on the weekends, let loose, sin a little, um, don't be over-righteous? No, I, I don't think so. I think rather he's, he's saying something else, and that is over-righteous. Don't be proud of your righteousness, as though somehow you could boast before God. And don't be overwise in the sense that, that you think you've got all the answers and don't need to listen to God. I think he's speaking to pride here. In, in the middle course he is advocating is the quiet confidence that comes from knowing what God says and living your life according to it and living humbly before God and others. That I don't push myself out there as some sort of big deal, uh, but rather I have a God who is a big deal, and I want to tell you about him. All right, the next section. Wisdom makes one 
wise person, I'm sorry, wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than 10 rulers in a city. So Solomon is speaking here now of the benefits of wisdom. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. Now that helps us to understand that previous section, doesn't it? Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. Think about verses 21 and 22 as you give your attention then to this question. Or right, I'm sorry, apply it, uh, those verses, to your life as a father or mother, if that's what God has called you to be uh, right now, as a classroom teacher, as a boss at work with people working under you, or whatever situation, station in life you find yourself uh, how do these verses now apply? Again, just going to jump back for a second. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you, for you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. All right, I'll give you a little bit uh, longer with this one. A lot of applications there you can come up with, and each one of us would have different ones. But Solomon's basic point is this. Don't let it drive you crazy that people are going to say angry things to you or hurtful things about you. Instead, with, with a measure of humility, remember that, that you have done that too, most likely, and that, that God is protecting you and watching over you. The, the words that, that Peter spoke in last week's epistle, that Jesus did not retaliate when people sp spoke against him or hurt him, uh, apply to us into this situation as well. Some humility as we entrust God to care for us. Next section. All this I tested by wisdom, and I said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Not in the sense that, that Solomon says, I'm not going to strive to for that wisdom that God provides, but a humility here that I know I can never understand everything that God understands. Whatever exists is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? So I turned my mind to understand, to investigate and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things, and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Let's think about that last verse. How can a woman be a snare to a man? Uh, question, the, the next one I think we've already answered. Why do you think Solomon despaired of ever becoming wise and then set out to understand and search out wisdom? It, it's a never-ending uh, task in our life, isn't it? To, to strive to know the things that, that God would have us know. We continue to learn. We know that, that God's wisdom is always far beyond ours. And yet we, we keep striving to learn what he teaches us in his word. All right, let's look at that first question. Now, how can a woman be a snare to a man? Men, is Solomon telling us to... Stay away from women. They're nothing but trouble. No. He's telling us to stay away from the wrong kind of women. How can a woman be a snare to a man? And maybe to to uh, grasp this, it's, it's helpful to know just what a snare was. It, it was set up to catch an animal to kill it. So a, a woman can be a snare to a man in, in what way? Well, Solomon probably is himself an example of this in the many relationships, marriages he had, and how those marriages, those relationships with those women led him away from worship of the true God, led him to do all sorts of foolish things uh, to try and make them happy, whatever it was. Uh, be careful that your desire for companionship, for sexual attraction, uh, and, and this can work the other way as well, women towards men, uh, does not lead you down a road uh, that will bring you only sadness and death, Solomon says. All right, the last section here before us. 
Look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. So I've considered it all, Solomon says, and, and this is what I'm, I'm coming to. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This only have I found, God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. Okay, those are some tough words to understand. Um, let's uh, look at this. In light of, of a woman like Ruth, um, who are described as upright, how are we to understand Solomon's words in verse 28? What is he talking about? I found one upright man among a, a thousand, no upright women. Uh, and yet we have examples of upright women uh, like Ruth. What, what, what do you think Solomon's saying here? Give that some thought. All right, before you say that Solomon is bashing women here, uh, go, go ahead, go back and read what he writes in Proverbs 31 about the woman of noble character. I, I think rather Solomon here is just using sort of a poetic way of speaking when he says one in a thousand men, no women. You know, I think he's just leading us to this point that we struggle with falling into our, our own sinful thinking, our own plotting, our own schemes. We think we've got life figured out. We think we know the way we want to go. And ever since the fall into sin, our own thinking only gets us into trouble. Again, thank God that in his mercy and patience, he does not destroy us but rather he sends us a savior. All right, that brings us to a conclusion here in our, our study this week. Um, invite you to join us this Thursday evening if you're able to do so for our, our Zoom class. Uh, I'll send out the, the link for that uh, early this coming week and, and we can go through some of these discussion questions just a bit more. Uh, blessings on your week, and uh, hope that you can join us tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, and uh, either our, our drive-in service at 11 o'clock or the online service at 8.30, or now we've also added a Saturday evening service at 5 o'clock. God's blessings.